All right, so thank you so much. Awesome, really great worship. Just love the prophetic singing. Love how God confirms what he wants to say prophetically before you even have to speak. And uh, anyway, I, I'm, I'm excited about this. We're launching a series, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure we're launching a series. No, we are. Launching a series on, the title of the series is A Glorious Church. And we're going to talk about in this session and this teaching today, the call to be a glorious church. And I just want to share how this came about and how, you know, I sense the Lord's direction. There's a lot of things I sense the Lord is saying. And sometimes it's, it's so much, you're like, okay, how do you kind of consolidate this all together and articulate it and express it so we understand but on, on Tuesday, last Tuesday, on November the 9th, I had a very vivid dream. And um, in the dream, Watchman Nee was talking to me. It was me and Watchman Nee. You know, we're buds. So me and Watchman Nee, he was talking to me. And, you know, Watchman Nee is the famous uh, pre preacher, a Chinese preacher who uh, died in 1972, but just a great man of God, a true forerunner. And we were talking in the dream, and he, he was talking to me about the Glorious Church. And of course, Watchman Nee wrote the book, The Glorious Church, but he was talking to me about the Glorious Church. And then that was, in, that was early Tuesday morning, and then later that morning, I don't know, around 8 o'clock that morning, John, we got a family text, and I won't share some of the stuff that goes on in that family text, but got a family text from John, and he sent this PDF book, and the name of the book was called The Glorious Church. And when I got that, I was like, okay, that, that is the Lord. I mean, just you cannot make that up. That, I mean, just the, the timing of it, the confirmation of it. it. It was not Watchman Nee's book, but it was another book called The Glorious Church. It was about getting a vision of the local apostolic church being a glorious church. And so when I saw that, I was like, okay, Lord, I know that I have a tendency to be dull of hearing, but I really believe you're speaking here. And so... What I believe as I waited on the Lord um, to kind of get some understanding is what I really believe the Lord is saying, Watchman Nee, who wrote a book on the Glorious Church, but he's also kind of known for the message he carried to divide the soul from the spirit. That's really, to me, one of the, the greatest messages he carried of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, of the dividing of soul from spirit. And I, I think putting all this together, what I really believe, and that would kind of take some of the other prophetic words that have been given over the last several weeks, is the Lord is speaking about this local church being a glorious church. And the way to get to be to that glorious church is for God to divide between the soul and the spirit to get at the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so... Go ahead, if you have your Bibles here, I want you to turn to, to a couple scriptures. You, I'm sure you know these, but just to get them in, just get them going in our thinking here is number one is Ephesians 5.27. Ephesians 5.27. And Ephesians 5.27, Paul talks about that he would have a glorious church. God is going to have a glorious church before he returns. We're living in the age where no matter what we see, even if it's only in a remnant, even what we see right now, the Lord's final word is he will have a glorious church. The Lord is going to fulfill this promise. I, I assure you of that. And it's incredible the times we live in. Yes, there is great darkness. Yes, there is shaking. Yes, it seems like things are just gone mad and crazy, but I assure you the good news, the hope for us is Ephesians 5, 27. He is going to present to Jesus Christ a glorious church that he might present to him the, uh, the church in all of her glory, having no spot, stain, or wrinkle, or any such thing, but she would be holy and blameless. God is raising up a glorious church. We are living in the day when the Lord is on the move. He, yes, there's, there's negative things that he's doing. I mean, they're, they're, 
humans might perceive them as negative. They're not negative, but humans might perceive them as negative. But this God is raising up a glorious church here at the end of the age, and God wants every local church to be an expression of this glorious church. The, that would be true with us here locally, that we would be a glorious church at Restoration Life, a church filled with God's glory. Now, that's the good news. The news that you might not think is as good is the pathway to get there because God has to do a work of surgery to get there. But that's good. We want the Lord to do surgery on us because God cannot bring a people that are soulish, a people that are carnal into the Holy of Holies. He can only bring a people who are spiritual. And when I mean spiritual, I mean Christ in them is their life source. Drew sang it prophetically, he being the life source. He is the source of life. Not self-life in your soul, not the carnal cravings of your body, but Christ in you the, 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 the life source you live by. And so let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We're, gonna, we're not going to talk about this too much today, but we're going to un unfold it in the next week. But I want to get it on our radar so we understand this is, this is where we're going. God wants to do a deep, deep work. And what Bethany's saying was so right deep calls unto deep at the sound of his, uh, at the sound of his voice. Deep calls to deep at the sound of his voice. And so to bring us into the depths of God means there must first be a work in us that cuts deep. And when we know that, and we know where God's going, and we know the end result and the final by byproduct of it, there will be less resistance in us when God begins to point his sword at us. Because the heart is what it's all about. And we talked about that last Sunday. The way we hear is absolutely a byproduct of the condition of our heart. Watch over your heart because from your heart flow the issues of life. Everything comes out of the heart. The heart is the source of everything, of your thoughts, of what you do, of who you are. It's the heart. And God would want us to, to bring us into a place of this glorious church by bringing a, his living, active word like a sword into the thrust, uh, thrusting it into us. You know, in the Old Testament, the animals were the sacrifice. And Christ obviously is the Passover lamb, but in the New Testament, we are the sacrifice. Romans 12, 11, our act of worship is to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And God puts us on the altar and he takes his living, active word and he cuts us open. And he, he lays us bare and his word penetrates to the very deepest part of our being, even to that place of joint and marrow, so deep he divides between our spirit and our soul because without that division, we begin to think what is what we, our thoughts are his thoughts. And God's like, no, I've got to divide the soulish thinking that you have from the spiritual thinking that is of the spirit so I can get to that very division of soul and spirit into the heart, which has the deepest thoughts and intentions of the heart. Because as we are in our heart, so we are. Proverbs said a little bit different, I'm paraphrasing it, but as a person is in their heart is who they are. The condition of your heart 
You can try to suppress it. You can try to masquerade it. You can try to put a mask on and hide it. But who you are in your heart eventually comes out. It comes out in the way you talk. It comes out in the way you joke. It comes out in what you do. You, we cannot fake who we are in our hearts. Therefore, God, to bring us close to himself, because of his incredible kindness, takes his sword, p penetrates deep, deep down to the very thoughts and intentions to expose our heart. This is good news. This is good news. We want this. I want this. Don't, you know, a lot of Christians sometimes are like, oh, that sounds terrible. That seems like God's going to, you know, tell me bad things about me or whatever. You know, yes, he is, but <laughs> he does it because he loves you. <laughs> all right? I mean, you're laughing because we've all had that, haven't we? We've all had the Lord tell us, okay, you're acting very immature right now, or your, your mindset on this issue is very much out of whack or whatever is we've had that, God is doing this because of his jealousy for us. What God is doing here locally in Restoration Life is he's bringing us into the Holy of Holies. He's bringing us into the Holy of Holies. He wants to move us from being outer court Christians who are occupied with the externals holy place Christians who are occupied with the gifts and the things of God to be holy of holy Christians who are preoccupied with God himself. And for God to bring us into that place where we are preoccupied with God himself, he must do a deep work of cutting, a deep work of surgery, a deep work of going into the very division of the soul from the spirit because what God wants to do in this division of soul from spirit is to show us by the living and active word of God, Brian, this thought you have is not from me, it's from your own soul. This thought you think that's leading you and directing you, this opinion, this human wisdom you have, Brian, that you think is from me, is not from me, it's from your own soul. Therefore, <clears throat> his goal in this is so that we would not be led by the human mind and its wisdom and its craftiness and its intelligence we would not be led by the emotions that are up one day and down another like a roller coaster. We would not be led by this will that wants what we want when we want it. But it would be the Spirit of God who dwells in our spirit being the leader of our lives. That is what God is doing in the division of soul and spirit. He wants to tell us by illumination and revelation, this part of you is leading you and this part of you is the soul and the self-life that's leading you and is making you be a soulish Christian, but I want you to be a spiritual Christian. One who is led by the Spirit of God, one who is filled by, with the Spirit of God, one who is controlled by the Spirit of God, that we operate to this place where Christ himself, by the Spirit of God, is dwelling in our hearts and filling our hearts. That's, that's where we're going. And his intention is to bring us into this place that we would be, we would be holy of holy believers, a priestly bride who ministers to him in the holy of holies. <clears throat> Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Did you know coming out of the mouth of Jesus Christ, when John saw him in, on Patmos, eyes of fire, his face shining like the sun, his hair white like wool, when John saw him, there was coming out of his mouth, out of sweet Jesus' mouth, a two-edged sword. And that two-edged sword goes right into the core of our being. 
Sweet Jesus. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> but he's good. He does that because he wants to bring us into a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with him. He does this because he wants us to be his beloved bride. He does this because he wants us to be his intimate friend. And so the blockages that are in our heart that would hinder this heart-to-heart, -heart, intimate, face-to-face, spirit-to-spirit relationship with him, he pinpoints to show us the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts so we could be one with him. God is doing this out of jealousy, not of anger. It's the jealousy he has for us. He's not mad at you. He's mad about you. And because of that, that jealousy, he speaks with the thrust of a sword to penetrate deep into the core to show us, Brian, this part of you, which you think is me, is actually your own soul leading you. You need to be a more a spiritual man who is intuitively knowing God inwardly by your spirit. And so he tells us, this sword, it pierces down to the division of soul and spirit. See, without this, we would never ever be able to know there is a division between the soul and from the spirit. If you ask most Christians, they, they don't even know they even have a spirit. They think their soul and their spirit are the same thing. They're, it's kind of like the soul and the heart and the spirit are synonyms. But this verse tells us that's not true. The soul and the spirit are different. And it's the division of that that helps us realize, uh, and we're going to go into more about this next week, that this division helps us. It goes down to the joints and the marrow. And listen to what it says. It's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Who you are in your heart is who you are. The thoughts that you have don't just come from your brain. They come from your heart. Now, not all of them. Some come from your brain. It's a complex subject, but I'm saying that our heart has thoughts, our heart has intentions, and that condition of the heart is who we are. And so, as I was praying about kind of the direction for the next, I don't know, three, four weeks, or really into the end of the year, I just felt like God was really wanting us to focus on this vision of a glorious church you know, what, and that's really the, the aim in this message. And then next several weeks is how we get there by this division of soul and spirit. I don't believe you can really have a glorious church. I don't believe you can have a holy of holies people until the Lord does this fresh circumcision of the heart where God cuts away the influences of the flesh, the influence of the, of the self-life, the influences of the soul so that our heart is now influenced and led by the indwelling Holy Spirit who is in us. And so as I was praying, okay, Lord, you know, what are you speaking? What are you saying? I just want to share just what I believe God is, is bringing us into, where he wants to bring, in this, bring us into, is he wants to bring us into a spirit-to-spirit, heart-to-heart, intimate relationship with him. Now, when you're born again, your spirit and the Holy Spirit, they become one. Your, the Holy Spirit is grafted onto your human spirit. Now, many of you know I was in a, I was in a skiing accident in, like when I was 18, so a long time ago. And I, I lost, I lost uh, half of my thumb in a skiing accident. I won't go into all the details right now. All I will say is, for some reason, the doctor thought he had this brilliant idea. He wanted to cut off my big toe and sew it to my thumb. And I'm just thinking, okay, that would be really awkward. You know, just having this big, t big toe on your thumb. Hey, I'm, I'm, I might give everyone the big thumbs up. Hey, you know, thumbs up, dude. You know, you get the thumbs up emoji. I would have the thumbs up on the literal big toe on my 
Thelma said, no, thank you. I do not want to do that. But one of the things they did have to do is they had to take a piece of skin and they had to, they had to take skin from this index finger right here and put it around my thumb. And they had to take another piece of skin and graft it onto my index finger here. So I now have a skin graft. And when I'm out in the sun, especially when I used to be out in the sun a lot more, this part of my skin gets like almost, I mean, just so brown and the rest of my skin's pale. So it looks like, like my friend said in high school, looks like you have a piece of liver on your finger. So it's my skin graft that I have on my finger. But the point is, I have this instant reminder of what it is my human spirit is like. My human spirit and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been grafted to my human spirit. That is amazing. The same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, the same spirit who created the universe, the same spirit who impregnated Mary, this spirit is grafted to your human spirit. You are one spirit with him. Already, right now, you don't have to do anything else. If you're born again, by his doing, by the doing of God in you, your spirit and his spirit are one. Amen. That is incredible. Yes. You are... I, I, and, it's just amazing. Amen. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one. I mean, wow. God's got to look down on us. The angels have to look down on us and it's like, guys, what are you doing? <laughs> You've got the creator of the universe living inside of you and you're struggling with all these petty little things. I mean, you've got God in you. Literally, God in you. Christ in you. I mean, it's either true or not true. Christ is in you. I mean, your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, glued together, inseparable. I mean, I could list out a million things about this, but you have Shekinah of glory in your spirit. You have rivers of living water in your spirit. You have truth in your spirit. You have the helper in your spirit. You have the mind of Christ in your spirit. You have the virtue of Christ in your spirit. You have the anointing in your spirit. You have the helper in your spirit. You have the kingdom of God in your spirit. I mean, incredible. That's the spirit to spirit relationship. That's what God has already done in Christ when you were born again. Your spirit and the Holy Spirit are one, joined together, inseparable, grafted to your human spirit. Now, the issue is the heart. The issue is the heart. The heart can grow cold. The heart can grow calloused. The heart can grow doubtful and unbelieving and bitter and cynical. The heart can grow proud. The heart can grow defiled by lust. The heart can grow judgmental or critical or cold. The heart can fall away from God. And so the issue is then you have this treasure here in your spirit, but the condition of your heart can block that flow, that flow from your spirit into your heart, and that determines how you live because the condition of your heart and who fills your heart, whether self or Christ, determines the life source you live by. And so God wants to bring us not only into a spirit-to-spirit -spirit relationship with him, but a heart-to-heart -heart relationship with him. That's what Bethany was singing about. That's what Diane prophesied last Sunday is the human heart, your heart, the deepest part of you, the deepest beliefs, 
the deepest thoughts, the deepest motives, those deepest beliefs in you that you can't change, that only God can change. God wants to unite that part of you with his heartbeat so that now we would become not just an intimate, not just an intimacy, we would become the very rhythm and beat, or, or the, we, would, we would embody the very rhythm and heartbeat of God, starting individually, but moving into this corporate dynamic, which brings us into something so much richer and so much more full. I mean, do you see what God wants to do? It's amazing. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are earthen vessels. And as the years go on, I realize my earthenness more and more. As we, you know, back in your 20s and 30s, even your 40s, you don't realize how earthen you are. You think you're far above all that. But, you know, get into your later 40s, you start feeling the earthenness. And I'm sure other people are like, just wait. But you start feeling your earthenness just a little bit more. But we have a great, incredible treasure inside of us, the Holy Spirit. And God wants to bring us into this place of a heart-to-heart relationship with Christ. It's beautiful. It's so beautiful. And so he wants to make us one heart with him where we would be the beating expression of God's heart. Not only individually, but corporately. The beating expression of God's heart. God wants to knit our hearts together as living stones by the Spirit in love. That we would, be, you know, God's, and I'm going to get into this a little bit more in a minute, but we, we are those living stones. We are that, those living stones. God knits together in love, love for each other, that then becomes the dwelling place of God in the Spirit where we love God with burning passion and are fervent in our love for one another. As this takes place, God's heartbeat is embodied within us. And I'm talking corporately. Corporately, it begins individually, but it must be expressed corporately. This is not meant to be, God's heart is not just for a me and Jesus relationship in your prayer closet. That's where it begins. But it must overflow into the corporate expression of this together, that we are not just these lone rangers, isolated and independent, we are a corporate body fit together. What God wants to do in his body can't be done in your prayer closet. It flows out of your prayer closet, and that's important, but it must come together as living stones. God wants to make this local church a Zion in the spirit. And I'm quoting from Hebrews 12, 18 through 24. You have come to Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God. See, God wants to make this a reality in the spirit. Zion is the holy of holies. You, you could say it another way. God wants to make us as living stones fit together to where we are this dwelling place of God. But it's not a dwelling place of God in the outer court. Where we, where we just barely know God and we're just in, in, in just barely into the kingdom or even the holy place where we're preoccupied with the things of God. He wants to bring us into that holy of holy relationship, a Zion in the spirit, a Jacob's ladder. You know, Jacob had that experience in Genesis 28. This is none other than the, than the house of God and the gate to heaven is God wants to make this local body the house of God and the gate to heaven. And you know, Jacob saw the angels ascending and descending and all that went around that dynamic. God wants that, this local church to be that. God wants to have us have worship. I think we tasted a little bit today, but this worship we see in Revelation 14, 1 through 5, where it's, it's a group, a, the first fruits, they're ministering to, to the Father and to the Son in the very holy of holies, their relationship. 
is a priest ministering to him in the Holy of Holies. They're face to face, intimate. They're worshiping him in a song no one else can learn. This face to face, heart to heart, intimacy with the Lamb, surrounded by his glory. I think we've tasted it. I think God has way, way more for us. And that's determined by the heart. See, what I'm describing here is, is, so, much, is so much further, so much greater than we can ask, think, or imagine. I just want you to get a hold of that for a second. See, I, you know, I'm talking and even myself talking, we think, okay, this is what we think it's going to be. It's going to be this, this, or that. And we get a, a frame in our minds. But the word of God says, no, he will do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we can ask, think, or imagine based on the power of God at work in you. So we always think that's about getting God to bless us when it's in fact getting about Christ to fill us. Read the context. It's about him coming to fill his temple called the church with the love of God to such a degree that the height and the width and the breadth and the depth of the love of God fills the living stones of God's house. So we are filled with him. And he says, then he will do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that you can ask, think, or imagine. The context of that verse is about God making a local church the dwelling place of God in the spirit. So, if we want that, he will do it. I'm convinced with all my heart, I am absolutely confident. I am absolutely, Anna just looked at me. So yesterday, you don't even know what I'm going to say. She said, ah. Yesterday, me and Anna went to Costco, and I was, I was telling her, I was like, you know, I really feel like Georgia. Sorry, I had to throw Georgia in there. I really feel, hopefully it doesn't quench the flow of the spirit, but I really feel like Georgia's going to win really big. I'm very confident here. I'm very confident Georgia's going to win really big. But my soul, you know, I just, I'm so nervous. Anyway, I'm, that has nothing to do with this. I had to throw that in there. I'm confident. <laughs> I am confident. I am so confident God is going to do this. God is going to do this work. I'm so confident God is going to do this work. God is going to do this work. But there is a condition. If we will believe him, God can only move if we believe him. If we will believe him, if we will hunger and thirst for him, Nothing quenches the move of the Holy Spirit faster than lukewarmness. Self-satisfaction. Satisfied by the things of this world, this, the things of this life. Nothing quenches the spirit of intimacy with him faster than that lukewarm spirit. That place that can, you, you know it, we all feel it. I mean, that place where we feel foggy, we feel kind of like, eh, you know, the hunger I once had isn't really there. You know, the, the meh emoji that you have on your phone is kind of like meh. You have that kind of attitude towards the Lord, meh. You don't really hunger that much, but you go through the motions, that meh feeling, that lukewarmness. If we will hunger and thirst for the Lord, he will do it. And here's another big one. If we will allow the Lord, if we will allow the Lord without resistance if we will allow the Lord to do a deep surgical work in our hearts, then God will make this place a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Amen. The Lord wants to make us a spiritual house of living stones. See, the place God's going to dwell is not in a building. It's in his people. And as those living stones are, are filled with Christ, and those living stones are fit together, 
God constructs a spiritual house where he dwells. God is not interested in dwelling in buildings. And that doesn't mean it's bad to have a building. We've got a nice building here. But it's not about the building. It's about the people. It's about the people having Christ. It's about the people who have Christ then being fit together. So just, just we had an analogy just to help us here is a couple years ago, we got a new modern backsplash and, and Angie and I made a, me and Angie made a really big mistake. The mistake was we should have put under cabinet lights in before the tile went in. And so if you ever think about putting back, a backsplash in, if you ever think about putting under cabinet lights in with it, do the lights first, okay? That's, that's my Home Depot tip for you. You know, I wouldn't take too many Home Depot tips from me or your house might look really bad, but take them from other people. But that's my one tip is, you, is put the under cabinet lights in first. So that's a mistake that me and Angie made. And so then when the tile went in, we didn't have the under cabinet lights on. And so when the lights were installed after that, it exposed every place where the tile was not in alignment and flush with each other. And that just remind. thankfully our contractor was very generous and, and fixed it for us uh, at no cost. But that showed to me and Angie that, okay, that's like what the church is when we're not in divine alignment. When we're not in divine alignment, we're kind of like that tile that's one's poking out here, one's recessed here, one's off here, one's off there. God wants to bring us into that divine alignment where we're fit together. And that's where the rubber meets the road. There's nothing like, you know, I'm thankful for online church and I'm thankful for live streaming and video on demand, but there's nothing like having a local body to rub you. Why are y'all thinking about me right now? There's nothing like having a local ecclesia to just rub you and grate you and sand at you and annoy you. And a lot of people just say, well, no, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. No, don't be that way because God's using that grinding. God's using that sanding to shape you to be fit together as that living stone in his house. Don't run from that. And you can't get it by watching online church. You need those relationships. You need that accountability. You need that rubbing. You need that sanding. You need that chiseling. You need people to call you out and say, hey, that right there, you need to get that in order. That right there, you need to get into alignment here. We need that local church some, somehow we've lost the, the beauty of the local church with online church and Zoom church and mega church that we've kind of just lost that, that living stone reality of God fitting us together. And, and I just, I see it all the time. You know, even, even people who watch us online is, is just not having that, that, that local church where they're being fit and sanded, and I've, I've heard it, you know, sometimes, well, I just don't feel like I fit. Well, maybe the reason you don't feel like you fit is God needs to do a work in your soul of chiseling and sanding and, and working and refining to make you fit as that stone. None of us fit when we first come in because God's shaping us to be that perfect living stone to be his dwelling place. So don't run from the work of God in the relationships in the local church. Let those shape you and refine you and fit you. So many people just run and they end up thinking, well, I can just have this me and Jesus relationship in the prayer closet. And it just doesn't work that way. God surfaces things in the local church that only come up in the context of relationships with each other. So it's living stones that, that God's fitting together. It's living stones that are being fit together to create a corporate spiritual house. I mean, you can just, I think in America, we've, we've become so independent and so, you know, it's, it's inbred into our culture is this independence. And 
this freedom and all that's great. I love it. But when it comes to the church, we've got to realize God is moving and he's moving corporately. What God wants to do to build a glorious church is a corporate work. And it goes far beyond just going to church on Sunday. It's, it's about us being connected to each other. And that's why, that's why it's so important. That's, listen, it's so important that we prioritize our Sunday gatherings together. There's been a trend, and it's not just here, but it's all around, you know, church leadership experts are doing the research, and they're telling us that after the pandemic, that, that I don't even know the percentage, 30 to 40% of the church is not coming back. And that, you know, well, you need to have an online option. And I'm all for the online option, and I appreciate the online option. I'm thankful for that. But you just cannot have what God wants to have online. It's just impossible. It's impossible. And that's why uh, scripture, I want to read this scripture, Hebrews 10.25. I'm just going to, you, you can turn there, you can just hear me read it. But I want you to hear, this is not the words of Brian, because he wants everyone here. This is the, word of, the words of scripture. Not forsaking our own assembling together. It doesn't have an asterisk there that says, but if you wake up and you're tired, it's okay to just connect on YouTube. There's no asterisk that's saying that it's okay. The, the Holy Spirit is telling us through the author of Hebrews, don't forsake your assembling together. If we have gotten into a habit of regularly skipping church on Sunday, I guarantee you, unless you have very extreme circumstances, that it's likely not the Lord that's leading you. It's likely the soul or the enemy. Listen to what Scripture says. Now, just so you know, I had this already in my notes, okay? I'm not picking on anybody, all right? So just, this is just something I felt the Lord just had me to share today, not knowing who's going to be here, who's going to hear online, okay? So not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some. It's a habit. Look, that's not my words, it's scripture. That some have gotten into a habit of only coming to a local church gathering once a month Twice a month. Yeah, we'll check it out online. That's, that's not what this scripture says. It's a habit. It's a bad habit. It's a bad habit like eating unhealthy. It's a bad habit like not exercising. It's a bad habit like, I don't know, picking your toenails or your fingernails or whatever. It's a bad habit. So the author of Hebrews is telling us this is a habit. It's a habit. And just like with any other habit, we need to break the bad habit, which is forsaking the local assembling together and establish the good habit, which prioritizes and sees the importance of the local gathering of the church. Because it says we've got to encourage one another. Every one of us need encouragement. Every one of us need to be encouraged in our relationship with the Lord. Now, I want you to see this next part. This is written to the end time church, which would be us. All the more, all the more, all the more. You see the emphasis there. As you see the day drawing near. And he's talking about the day of the Lord the second coming of Jesus Christ, the end times. The author of Hebrews is telling us, as you approach the end of the age, which we are, we don't know when, but we are approaching the end of the age, the writer of Hebrews is telling us, do not forsake the gathering together of the ecclesia of the local church in fact, all the more you should be more faithful 
as that day comes near. I believe the trend, listen to this, I believe the trend that we see of this regular skipping of church is, is influenced by the spirit of the age that could ultimately lead into apostasy. I believe that. It, there is a current right now in the culture that's influencing the church. You cannot get what you need to get just online. You cannot get it just on YouTube or Zoom. Now, again, I know, I know there's people watching us online and they're protesting and they're saying, you don't know my circumstances. And you're right, I, I don't. And so there are definitely unique circumstances to this, okay? So just know, I know there are unique circumstances to this. I'm not saying, I'm not painting broad strokes. I know there's, there's unique circumstances to, to every context. I know that, all right? So just understand I know that. However, I believe this trend is part, it, is, it could be the very beginning stages of the great falling away from the faith. So we have to be careful then that we don't come under that influence of the spirit of the age which is leading to, which is leading to apostasy. If we don't understand the great falling away has begun, it has, it has, and it's going to increase, that that the importance of regularly gathering together with other members in the body of Christ in the ecclesia. Now, I know, and listen, I know that, you know, people who would watch us online, they would be like, okay, you just don't know what some of the churches are like are out there and the things they preach. And I get all of that. I really do. So this is something you need to pray about if you're in that situation. But, but I'm just saying that we've got to come back to getting God's heart for the local gathering of the church, the ecclesia, the body of Christ. This is not, we don't go to church, we are the church, and we gather together under the head of Jesus Christ as his body to be that, to be that, that the, those containers of God's life who organically express God's life together interdependently. We need to come back to that great and glorious vision that Paul had in Ephesians of the glorious church, of the local ecclesia, of the local body, realizing that we cannot ever come into the fullness of Christ just by staying in my prayer closet with Jesus. We need each other to come into what God wants to do. So you can read the notes. It's all in there. I haven't deviated like I did last Sunday yet. Okay, Isaiah 65, 8 says, Thus says the Lord, new wine is found in the cluster. There is coming an end time move of the Holy Spirit. There is coming an end time move of the Holy Spirit that is going to surpass anything that's ever happened in fact, Joel talked about it in Joel chapter 2, 28, that he is going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I am going to pour out my spirit. And it says, he gives us a timetable. It is before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Yes, Acts Chapter 1 and 2, the day of Pentecost, was a down payment of that, but the full and the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit that's coming is going to surpass that, and it's this new wine God is going to bring is found in the cluster. That means if you want to be part of this end-time move of God, you can't, you, you've got to be connected to the local church, to the local ecclesia. You've got to be connected to that local body as living stones fit together where the habit that we have is we go to church. We go to church. And I, again, we don't go to church. We attend a local gathering, if you want to be technical, we attend a local gathering of the ecclesia every Sunday. I wish we had some of that old-fashioned mindset we used to have in our culture where we never, ever missed church. 
We've lost that. And I think we've lost something because of that. We need to get that back as new wine is found in the cluster. New wine is found in the cluster. What God is going to do at the end of the age is found in this corporate move of God. What God's going to do at the end of the age is corporate, not individual. It's through the body, not just one or two anointed vessels of God. And I love it. One thing I love about our church is amazing to me. Even last Sunday was a beautiful example of that where I preached a message. And right after the message, Diane and Alice um, got up. And even Jeanette texted me later that, you know, the Lord was saying the very same thing to me. The Lord was saying the very same thing to me that God wants to deal with the heart. And I, I had, I, you know, sometimes I wish people would tell me in advance because I wouldn't have to study so much to find out what God wants to say. Just why don't you tell me what God's saying in advance Maybe I don't have to spend so much time trying to figure it out. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, know, the the Lord, I I love that about this local body. Even what was sung prophetically, it's just the way the body flows together as out of our relationship with him. Um, it's, It's such a beautiful thing. Just trying to figure out here where to go. I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna end there. <laughs> Anna was outside. <laughs> yes, I love it. <laughs> yes, Lord. Let's wait on the Lord just for a second. Amen. I feel like, just feel that's a good place to stop. I had other things I was going to say, but uh, I think I'll end there. So anyway, let's, uh, let, me, let me end with prayer. And uh, Father, we just pray right now. We just thank you, Holy Spirit. I, I just want to pray for us here and even li- those listening online, that we would have a, a, rene- a, 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 we would have a scriptural view of the importance of the local church. That I just want to pray, right? I'm going to break off this influence of the culture, the spirit of the age that has come into the church to say this, this local gathering of the church is just is not important or it's just something we can skip on a regular basis. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. It is a big deal to God. And I just pray right now, Lord, um, I just want to pray right now, Father, that you would break off from us any influence of the spirit of the age that would not value and prioritize our local, local gathering of the ecclesia. Father, that we would place a very high importance upon gathering together. And Lord, I pray that where we have established a bad habit of skipping or leaving or whatever, of not attending on a regular basis, that Lord, that thing would be broken off of us, even those listening online as well. Father, that you might break those things off, Lord, that influence of the age. It's really a a spirit of antichrist is really what it is. Lord, that that because the body of Christ is Christ, and to despise the body of Christ and the gathering of the body of Christ is to be influenced by the spirit of antichrist. Lord, I pray right now that every, every work of this spirit of antichrist who would try to poison the mind toward the attitude of the local church would be driven away in the name of Jesus. 
And Lord, there would be a work of the Spirit of God bringing us into divine alignment. Divine alignment, we pray, Father, where we would come into that alignment, Lord, with the apostolic vision of the local ecclesia like Paul had of the importance and the value of the local body of Christ. Lord, change our mindset and our paradigm, we pray. In the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, as we, as we go deeper in this study of seeing the glorious church come forth and the, the division of soul and spirit you want to bring, Lord, I pray, Father, that you would, just, you would just do a deep work. If you want the Lord to do a deep work in your heart, just raise your hand. I've got my hand raised, okay? Lord, would you do a deep work in our hearts, Lord? Lord, would you do a deep work in our hearts? Lord, we don't want to resist you. Lord, we want to be moving at the rhythms of your heartbeat. In fact, that's one thing I forgot to say is God is going to bring us to a place where we only move at the rhythm of his heart. It's very important that we come into that place where we're so sensitive to the spirit that we move to the rhythm of his heart. Lord, would you make us tender inside? Lord, would you soften our hearts? Lord, would you just do that deep work inside of us, Lord, that we could move, Lord, at the rhythm of your heart. We would only go where you want us to go and only say what you want us to say. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name.